Hello, good morning everyone, and I'm delighted to be here among you. I am mad. I am a mad global thinker. And by saying that I'm mad is because I believe that madness can be a good thing. Madness can push us outside our norms, our borders, and can make us dream crazy dreams and go after them. Um, I'm going to try and make this presentation, this talk, as less egocentric as possible. And what is very important for me is what made me what I am today. And what I am today is thanks to people that were uh, part of my life, people that I met during my career and during the course of this life so far, and also thinkers who have been very important for me. So um, I'm going to talk first about someone who is quite mad in a good way, is the guy that you can see in the photo behind me, and I call him my inspiration. And this is my father. My father is a well-known Greek journalist, uh, but it's a very interesting start that he had in life. Um, he had a very troubled and a very sad, if you like, uh, childhood, and so he decided when he was 16 to escape from this reality that he absolutely hated, and he wanted to, to get out of it and explore the world, and he enlisted himself as a sailor in a cargo ship. And in this way, he uh, managed to travel the world at a very young age and come across people and cultures and, and countries that shaped what he was. And for me, all these stories became an inspiration and they also became the impetus to become a journalist and to continue this legacy that he was creating for me. This is my inspirator, and this one here is a very well-known Greek poet, Konstantinos Kavafis, perhaps some of you know him. He wrote a very famous poem, one of his very famous uh, poems is Ithaca. Ithaca is a Greek island, but it is also a destination, and it is a journey. And the way that this poem starts is when you set out for Ithaca, hope and pray that the journey is long, um, it's full of discoveries, and it's full of adventures. And it closes like that when you reach Ithaca. If you think that it is poorer than you expected, then it is, not, it is not Ithaca that has fooled you. It is actually the journey that has made you richer, wealthier, and it's the journey that, has, uh, that you need to cherish in life. This is a poem which has defined the way that I think and the way I behave and um, see life, look at life, since my, my early teens. And this here, am I pressing the right button? Yes, I am, is the writer. This is Fernando Pessoa, a Portuguese writer, one of the most important ones in the 20th century, born at the end of the 19th century. Um, he was a guy who died relatively young in his mid-40s, but he left a fantastic legacy of 25,000 um, poems, prose, philosophical writings. One of his books is the book of Disquiet, which is like an autobiography. And in this book, he describes the restlessness, uh, this peace which he could never find inside his soul, his spirit, his mind, but which was so creative for him and led him to write all this uh, uh, amazing work. I remember one of the phrases in these writings, which was, I got up early this morning and it took the day for me to realize my existence. And for me, this very phrase epitomizes what life is about, what we are. By the time we reach our teens, by the time we complete our studies, or we embark on our careers, or we start our families, we still have not realized what life is about. And we reach an age where we start thinking backwards as to what we have achieved, what we have not achieved, and then by that time we reach an older age, and perhaps the train has reached the, the terminal. The train, now that I mentioned that, for me, life is a train. I feel like I am a passenger in uh, the train of my life, and it goes through uh, villages and cities and countries, and there are people who jump on board, and there are people who decide to get off the train, and there are people uh, that become part of my life, and I become part of theirs, and this is a fascinating journey until it stops at the terminal station. And this is where my exploration of the world started. I decided to become a journalist because I wanted to explore the world and I wanted to meet people who would make my life more meaningful. And these people were coming from all walks of life and I would like to share some of them with you here. 
I met creative people, like the ones that you see here in this picture, which was taken in London about seven years ago. I find it very interesting how people present themselves, the way they dress, the way they wear their hair, the, their gestures, their facial expression. Every picture is telling a story, and it is telling an amazing story about its background, about the family, about the wishes, the dreams, the desires. So this is for me a very, very telling, a very interesting picture of these relatively quirky people who are making a statement by their existence. I met people who are unlucky, and there are millions, if not billions, of them out there. I met people who live in poverty. This shot was taken in Kazakhstan, in Almaty, about 10 years ago. I was there for a conference, and I always like to take time outside, you know, the, the very limited space of the conference and see people, visit people in smaller uh, neighborhoods or in smaller streets where someone wouldn't go easily. And I came across this young mother. She was having her, her baby on her lap. In Kazakhstan, about 6% of people live below the poverty line, and this woman has to live by less than $3 a day. And I was thinking, you know, this baby, does, she doesn't know what the future holds for her. She has no idea yet about the circumstances of her life, her country, her immediate world, and the, and the wider world. And that made me, you know, want to capture this, this very moment. The unprivileged. I find this photo here quite moving. It was taken in Cuba uh, in 2003. Um, I was um, uh, walking around Habana, and it was um, a replication of this ritual which was taking place in the 17th century, and it was the way that the soldiers back then, the Spanish soldiers, would break the news to the people. And um, I wanted to capture this, this very moment, and in the background you can see a young man um, who's an amputee, and uh, he can't move, he's stuck in his wheelchair, and for me, it was as if he was watching life going by and not being able to participate. And so always, throughout my career as a journalist, I always try to give voice to people or to give a space, if you like, in, in the public sphere to people who are unprivileged or unlucky for one reason or another. I came across homeless people. This photo is taken in Tokyo, which we all think that is a very wealthy, uh, super high-tech city, and it is, absolutely it is. But at the same time, there are 5,000 homeless people in the streets of Tokyo, and they live in makeshift shelters, in carton boxes like the ones that you see here, and all their belongings are the few things that they keep inside these, these boxes. They don't beg, they're not beggars. They, they will hardly ask of you of any money. But I found it quite shocking that a city like that, a country where more or less the distribution of wealth is equal to have 5,000 homeless people. I met people who are marginalized for one reason or another. This photo is taken outside of Cairo in a community which is called Abu Zabal. I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but it is actually a community of lepers. Believe it or not, Leprosy still exists in our world. Someone would think that it has been eradicated, but it is not the case. So one of my assignments as a journalist was to visit this community and see how these people live. 4,000 people, uh, normal lives with families, with uh, couples getting married, bringing children to the world. They have their elementary school, a high school. They have their church. They have um, a hospital. They have even a prison. And this photo was taken, they are inmates, and it was taken inside the prison in the leper colony of Abu Zabal. And I was fascinated by a very simple fact that no matter how wealthy or poor, no matter how privileged or underprivileged people are, we have the same sins, the same weaknesses, and the same issues everywhere. And this was a defining moment in my career. I was uh, selected in 1999 to become a CNN fellow. So from the Greek media, it was my leap 
to the international media. And I joined CNN as a fellow. I was trained in Atlanta, and that, was, that completely changed the way I look at the world because I became part of an organization, which is uh, what we call global, in reality global, working together with people from all over the world, someone from New Zealand, someone from Turkey, another one from Greece, another one from, from China, and we were all working together for a common cause and also under more or less the same ethical framework. And it was an eye-opener for me working with CNN. And now I would like to present some of the people who have influenced me and what I do in my life. One of them being inevitably Ted Turner. I have strong ad admiration for him because he is a guy who transformed uh, news distribution and news coverage. Ted Turner, perhaps some of you know already, that he's the, the founder of CNN. Before that, Ted Turner had inherited um, a company from his father, a billboards company, which was uh, worth $1 million. In 1998, his um, wealth was so big that he was the first philanthropist who donated to the United Nations $1 billion. So you can imagine the journey of this man. For some, he was uh, a madman. This is why I'm saying and why I said in the beginning that madness for, for me is absolutely essential when someone wants to chase very big dreams. So when he said in the end of 1970s that he wanted to start a 24-7 news channel, everyone told him, Ted, you're mad. This is a suicidal move. You're never going to make it, and you're going to destroy everything that you have achieved so far. But he didn't listen to anyone, and he went on. And he went on to completely uh, transform the news industry forever, because this is what CNN did. And one of the phrases that I remember he has said is that we are going uh, to cover the world until it ends. And if it's going to end, CNN will be there, and it will cover it live. One of the people that I met during my uh, work with CNN is Christiane Amanpour. And I call her the adventurous. I think that she epitomizes the woman who is fearless, she's gutsy, um, she gets what she wants, she wants answers and she's going to get them. And she's a very, very courageous journalist who became also a very powerful, a very influential woman, a true global thinker. And then another defining time in my career was when I joined Al Jazeera English. I have to say that nothing has come easily. It takes 20 years for an overnight success, as they say for Microsoft and the likes of these companies. So some things, you know, when someone describes them, seem, may seem quite easy to happen, but they are not. I think the secret lies in chasing one's dreams, in, in being as gutsy and as fearless as possible, and not listen to people who are dry of ideas, who are going to step in and say, don't try that, don't do that, don't get outside your comfort zone. You are already a household name. Why would you want to move to Qatar or to a Muslim country? Um, you live very comfortably here. I ignored everyone who was saying that I was mad in deciding to join Al Jazeera and moving to Qatar. I did it. It was a life transformer for me because I, I lived in a country which is a very conservative Muslim country, very different to what I was used to, but it was exactly what I wanted to live and experience, a world completely different from, from what I was used to. And there I met someone whom I find is a true visionary leader. And this is uh, the Emir of Qatar, uh, Hamad bin Khalifa Al Thani who um, has created a brand out of his country in an extremely successful way. If you think about it, 15 years ago or 20 years ago, very few of us had heard of a tiny, tiny state with less than 200,000 citizens, which was called, it is called Qatar. Today, it is one of the most influential brand names globally. And I think this is thanks to a very pioneering leader as is the Emir, who has created Al Jazeera and created a brand name out of his country, and a very influential stakeholder in the Gulf region, in the Middle East, and beyond. This forward thinker here is my mentor. I believe in knowledge. I believe in lifetime education. I think that someone needs to stay in touch with 
a, a rapidly transforming world all the time. Otherwise, we lose the train. And so I decided to take my Oxford degree three years ago. And that was a very enriching experience for what I am today and for creating Global Thinkers Forum. Mark Pantresca, uh, for me, he's a beacon, an intellectual beacon, because he helped my mind think in a more systematic way, and he helped me understand the world as, um, as a, a world created by human networks, because what brings value to everything is social capital, and also looking at the wider picture. And he was a very important part of the whole concept of Global Thinkers Forum, which deals with uh, the failing uh, leadership around the world. There is a re leadership gap in our world, and we need to see how we can bridge it. What can we do to create better leaders, the leaders of tomorrow? There are so many different things and issues which are newcomers. It's, uh, we didn't have to deal with them before, like crippling economic models, right? like urban uprisings all around the world, like this information surplus. And, and all the new sources of information that are thanks to social media, which can be good, but at the same time, they can be quite confusing. And so it's a world that needs to take into account that people need to think globally, operate locally, but think as, as global players and as global uh, stakeholders. And uh, our first event took place in Amman in Jordan, and we were joined by a very important global thinker, who is Her Majesty Queen Rania. Uh, we were extremely honored to uh, be taken under her patronage. Queen Rania, for me, I have great respect and admiration for her. Uh, she's a true global thinker. She's a role model as a mother, as a woman, as a leader. She's a change maker. Uh, change does not happen overnight, and it should not happen overnight, even when we, when we are not happy with our immediate environments or, or with our societies or with our country. I believe that change, change should be gradual, and it should, play, should take place at smaller scale, and then we would unite all changes together, and we create a transformation for the public good and for the, for the uh, good of, of the society. And this could be the leaders of tomorrow. This shot was taken in Ankara 10 years ago. I absolutely love Turkey, and I'm delighted and honored to be back here. And um, I, was, I loved those guys. They are eight, nine, 10 year old boys, and they were just pushing each other to get in front of my camera, and they're teasing each other. And you know, I thought that perhaps one of these guys could be the next leader of the country, of an organization, the CEO of a very big company, we will never know, perhaps, but what we can do is try and create an environment where he can act as a good leader. And I guess that's it. For me, uh, life is a journey. It's an experimental journey, which uh, we, take, we undertake unwillingly or involuntarily, if you prefer the word. The word. It's a journey of the spirit and the soul and uh, through the material world. And so what makes us what we are is the people that we come across. So in this sense, I am you. Thank you.